Hi, welcome to Bookmark. I'm your host, Don Noble. My guest today is memoirist David Tipmore. Just as Henry David Thoreau went to the woods in the middle of the 19th century to live deliberately to see if he could find a new life there, David Tipmore moved to the small town of Marion, Alabama to see if he could find a new life there. The report on that experiment is his new book, My Little Town. I spoke with David Tipmore in Studio UA in the Digital Media Center on the campus of the University of Alabama. David, it is good to see you. It's an honor to be here, Don. I read your book. I loved it. I, I, I was not appalled because I've been living in Alabama for a very long time. I understood what you, what you were doing, but I was fascinated by your experience as a person who came to Alabama. And you, like so many people, came to Alabama from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And loosely, you've had a very exciting cosmopolitan life. Where were you a child? Where did you go to school? Where have you worked? I'll keep it in a, a sure, nutshell sure. here if I can. <clears throat> Born in Washington, D.C., in Bethesda. Father worked in the Pentagon. Then a sudden and abrupt move to a farm in Indiana for five years, and then to a town outside uh, Boston. So then on to school in the Midwest and Penn, and then on to New York to work the Village Voice. What did you do at The Voice? <laughs> was Mailer still there? Did he still own um, it? Yeah, he came in a couple times, but yeah. he was angry at Dan Wolf and Ed Fancher, the owner, so he didn't come in very much. I lucked, a I lucked out on a job on the city desk. Now, at The Village Voice, the city desk is not like even the Tuscaloosa newspapers. So there I was, a tiny little desk with the phone ringing, and everybody came in. I mean, all, I can't even tell you how many people that I, that our New York politicians, Trump showed up once, there we go. And then on to that, um, after New York, I went overseas, worked as a foreign correspondent in London and Paris and Tangier. Who were you working for? The Village Voice again, ah. they had asked me to do it as, you know, you could do that for The Voice, they, you had that freedom. And uh, then I went to Florida where I had jobs with University of Miami and also writing again for national publications. And then, are you asking now how I got to where I wrote about? Um, I had a friend who moved to a small town in Alabama that I thought, oh, well. Anyway, um, the crash of 2007 was coming. There are practical reasons. Real estate, I knew was gonna plummet. I had an aging parent, all the typical things, and I really was looking for a college town in the south near the coast some coast, Georgia, <laughs> somewhere, but I didn't quite, I would come up to Love Lady, we call it Love Lady in the book, and the people were lovely, and I got people, someone offered me a job, I found an historic home that at a price, of course, you could not imagine in Florida. In America, you can always move south. <laughs> you cannot wonderful. move north. People, that is so People true. who sell their, their long-held homes in Alabama <laughs> cannot move to Massachusetts. You're right. I have family who would love me to move back, and I say, I think that's too late. That what job. was your job there? What'd you do? At, at the, at, in, in, in Love Lady? Yeah. In I was the dean at Marion Military Institute there. So I was really in, as if I were in a witness protection program. And that's the way my, the president referred to me, David, you sure you aren't in a witness protection program? <laughs> it was quite accidental. You hint at this in the book, but what was the response of your friends, colleagues, family in Massachusetts or New York or Indiana when you told them you were moving to um, rural Alabama? Well, I have been very itinerant in my yeah, life, yeah, so yeah. they were used to that. I mean, there were a couple stints in Saudi Arabia and a stint in Venezuela, so they weren't surprised at the oddness of the choice. But because of the prejudices up north about the south, they really thought I had sold my soul to the devil, literally. How could I possibly survive? And they didn't also realize, I think, my serious wish to find a home in a 
that wasn't so urban and sophisticated and so forth. So, so you had a goal. I did. I, 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 it was an adventure, and yet I did. I mean, I was on that pattern that I think other people are on now. We've been coastal elites for, for too long. We want to come back to our roots in the middle of the country. And uh, those roots are mostly what we remember, and our memory is not always accurate, is it? There must have been, and we, I, I think this is not something that you necessarily had consciously in mind, but when Henry David Thoreau decided on his experiment, he said, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately. And he meant to get something out of it. And he did, he did get a book out of it. He got walled and, and you got my little town. But, but he, he, had, he wanted to immerse himself in the world of nature, in a sense, 24 hours a day, in which he did for two years, two months. And you wished to immerse yourself in small town southern life. Mm -hmm. But what, what did you think was going to be in it for you? Well, I talk about, about it in the sense that I was looking for authenticity. Ah. I'd been surrounded by inauthenticity from the time I was at Norman Mailer's birthday party when he was 60 and the Four Seasons in New York. And there was so much performance in my life, both personally and with the people around me, that I thought, can't I ever find that again, where people will make a casserole and bring it to your back door and play, play at cards or Monopoly for, for entertainment, things that simple. That's so I was kind of looking for simplicity and authenticity. Did you imagine when you moved there, now it's been 11 years since you moved there, when you moved there though, did you imagine that was it? You were going to grow old, retire, live, die there? Oh, how naive we are, really. Aren't we naive? Don't we have live by impressions that are sometimes terribly inaccurate and false? Um, I've never looked too far ahead in my life, never on purpose. Because I am single, I have the advantage of not ever being tied down too much unless I was happy in a place. And I stayed in, have stayed in places for a decade and 20 years, and so I'm not a complete flibberty gibbet. But um, I, I really did hope that I could settle down and stop this constant movement. You meant to find a home. I did. Right. I did. Well, in a sense, you did. I mean, you were the, the I, I make a real distinction. I've, I've lived in the South a total of 56 years. Mm -hmm. And when I read a book, like Paul Theroux's last book, yes, where he travels for a few weeks. Deep South. Deep South. Yeah. Very good book. It is. And, and not wrong, but of necessity shallow. He doesn't know what he's writing about. He senses it, his instincts are good, his writing skills are terrific. He's not wrong, it's just that you know he hasn't earned all of, all of that wisdom because he hasn't been there long enough. He was in Greensboro for a blink and wrote a wonderful chapter about Greensboro. Exactly. Not wrong, but still thin. You were there 10 years, you learned a lot. And I'm interested in, in your assessment or in, by category almost. For example, you're not well, am I right, or are you a person of faith? Do you think of yourself as a, as a person of faith? Well, um, living there, I didn't realize I was really going to write about it till sometime into the experience. Mm -hmm. And you can't live in a small southern town with having a church, especially in the job I had. They would have thought I was the devil's disciple if I <laughs> did not go to church. So I chose the... Um, least offensive in my opinion, which was the Episcopal Church, and they couldn't have been more kind and welcoming. But faith has always been a struggle for me. My parents were shoppers through faiths, different denominations. They struggled with, with doctrine. They certainly understood parts of it. But so in a southern town, when you uh, encounter a colleague who says things like, soccer is a communist sport, you know you're going to have a problem probably with the way the Bible is interpreted and uh, Jesus' message is interpreted. 
and you were in church with Mary Ward Brown. I sure and was. And you became acquainted with her. That's a treat. I was so fortunate, and she was so kind to all of my visiting relatives that would come down because I think she found them fascinating, really. And I, I hired her son at, the, at MMI to work, Curtly, who used to pose for Margaret Ellen Webb. She'd use his hands in paintings that she did. Anyway. But the churches of Marion, yes. there are probably half a dozen oh, or more. more. Yes. And it's, it, again, what, what we're doing all the time, you and I and most of America, is, 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 a, is, is a kind of uh, um, two, si two, two sided, two, you and I have a, a, what, a double vision, mm -hmm. d d in a sense. We know, you kn I know what Tuscaloosa is like, you know what Marion is like. And we also know what New Yorkers and people in Massachusetts think <laughs> yes. Alabama is yes. like. And of course, the two don't fit together perfectly. But in this isolated, tiny town where they have a whole number of churches, all beleaguered, they have hierarchy. And I was delighted by the, <laughs> by the remarks that you made about where they all stand. It's you were at the top. Well, yes, we, we are socially, <laughs> but you know this, and most anyone listening who lives in Alabama will recognize the, the doctrinal hierarchies of Alabama churches, the Episcopalians, and then you have the Presbyterians, and then you have the Methodists, and then you, the Baptists are somewhere in there, depending on the size of the town yeah. and how high the Baptist church is. And then you get below that to Church of Christ and various Pentecostals. And the longer the sign, the no more, more words on the sign, <laughs> the lower the status, and the smaller probably. I think you're probably. going to, I'm going to have to write another version of this book with some of your <laughs> insights here. But the, um, there was an amusing remark. I don't remember which minister made it, but, but he was suspicious of the beliefs of Episcopalians. Oh, he was, the a, Baptist minister. As yes. to whether they were really Christians. Oh, absolutely. And of course it hurt the Baptist, or the Episcopalian minister deeply. He was deeply <laughs> offended as he should have been. But that's the kind of, I mean, you're laughing, but in a small town you see the humor goes out the window very quickly because you have to take sides somewhere along the line. You were, I mean, you had a, a, you had a job with status. And you had a house yeah, with status. That's right. I'm laughing, but yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> relative. It's a town this of is three the context people, we're in. Let's not go overboard. All right. Uh, but you were gainfully employed, successfully, and, and so on. But the, the economy of this place, does the economy control everything? Is it just, is it hopeless? What do young people do to earn a living? Do they have to leave? I struggled with the chapter on the economy because I, I don't want to say the town's dying, but it's certainly struggling. Yeah. And uh, the large reason is both the educational system and the economy, both equally. The problems feed on each other. There are no ways to be ambitious there besides public school teaching. And again, nothing against that. It's an honorable profession. But for women, I don't know what you do except teach. And then you get into the issue of, do you, are you a uh, math and science person or a humanities person? If you're a humanities person, you better know this, I'm sure. You might as well move away because there are no jobs. I mean, math and science, you can be an accountant, you could do you know, bookkeeping, but there is nothing there to encourage ambition or real competence beyond a very local level. If you could prescribe, if you had power, what could turn a place like that around? What would have to be done? Oh dear. Build a factory and hire everybody? I mean, is it, is? Well, you, you have to start with, frankly, the religion and the, the sort of basic idea. I hope I'm not offending anyone in the studio, but their idea of the world or ambition is so negative anything outside what we know and our family and our lives there in that little town. Um, and Thornton Wilder touched on this in a northern version of, of our town. It, it so defeats progress. It so stunts growth. And education, again, why do you really need to be educated? You'll probably be farming. 
you might be a coach, you know, again, not that that's bad, but it's just... But it doesn't take care of everybody. No, it does not. So inevitably people will leave. Yeah. Was there, one of the, one of the images of the small town, whether it's Norman Rockwell or Thornton Wilder, is always a kind of uh, peacefulness. Did you, what about crime in places like that? Just, does it exist at all? Uh, well... Did it, you lock your doors? No, never. <laughs> there is an occasional explosion in a meth lab out in the country. <laughs> but you know, people have to make a living somehow and you can't do it by a high paying job. Um, no, I wouldn't say, you know, that would be meth labs. Um, there's not a lot of other options, really. No. The amusing mm -hmm. element of it all, and yet perplexing, I'm always astonished. I, I watch the evening news, and I'm told the results of a recent poll, which 47% of Americans cannot name the vice president, or 52% of Americans do not know the, the three branches of government or something. And I think, how do they manage, how do those Americans manage to keep that information out? But you lived in a place where the, where the, the culture was designed to keep modernity mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. keep the 21st century out. Mm -hmm. How do they do that? Uh, I think I was amused by your no Beatles, no Warhol, <laughs> no. <Right>. no. <laughs> Well, it offends their religion. A lot of modernity after the 1960s, this is hardly a thing I've come up with, but it's offensive to people who love the 1950s and before. Um, if you aren't involved in a biblical family and you're not involved in singspirations and memorizing Bible verses and, uh, and uh, funerals and the ways that they practice them there, then you really can't imagine what the last 70 or 80 years have been, and you don't want to imagine them. And they have a certain point. A lot of bad stuff <laughs> has been brought in in the last 70 years. I mean, they would argue. What about television? Literally, television. Oh, in the no, evening, do people watch television? Um, they do. Now, what programs they watch is kind of sad, really. I don't know. If they stream. They do all stream. They've got their satellite dishes and so forth. But I think they stream... Oh, what was that program about the long-haired guys in Louisiana? The, oh, oh some, right, sure. They liked that. Sure. was a popular one. Yeah. The students at MMI or the kids will stream anything in MTV, but they don't really apply it to their lives. There's no way to apply it They're to They're not their watching lives. Masterpiece Theater. No, no, only the Episcopalians. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but it's true. The, the subject of endless and unfathomable <laughs> dimensions is race and there is no there is no solution there is no answer but a couple of a couple of conclusions so to speak based on your observations that i found perfectly sensible one and you can speak to this is what 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 we could loosely call the resegregation of of this part of of the world of America? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it starts with uh, the school system, of course, which has again been written about many times, but it's shocking to see. Yeah. Oh, now, up north, it's not so very much better, right. but it is a little better. It all depends. And then you go from the school system to a kind of intercultural avoidance. And again, the churches are separated. Um, so there's no connection there. And what's happened, I think it's gone on so long, tragically, this, this segregation, whether it's, it's, a, it's conscious or not, um, that there's now a different culture entirely. It's not just a race issue. It's a culture issue. The blacks don't really enjoy socializing with the whites. There was a, one, one quote in your book where you were discussing efforts that were made from time to time to be inclusive, mm -hmm. to put on an event or a program mm -hmm. or a speaker that you were sure would interest the black community, but it does not oh, come and to, naively, it does not attend. I would be the northerner sitting there waiting at the event, 
where are the black faces? I can't wait to, to have some, some neighbors and so forth. They would never show up. And of course, my passage about Halloween, my experience at Halloween in this town was shattering in a way for me because standing there with my little, my bag, and there, there they were with no costumes, all black children. Um, it, was, it was very sad. All the lights were off in the front porches on the streets because they were scared. They were threatened by it. So it's, the, a, a lot of the division is based on a kind of fear? Um, yes, I think so. I do. And just a difference, so immense. So the difference is so immense now. The music, look at the music that, that the two races often enjoy listening to. I don't know a lot of blacks that wa listen to country western music. And in the, my little town, there was a huge social gap. Food will sometimes bring them together, but that's it. You have a wonderful chapter. Actually, it, it moves around through the entire book, is the role of history. Again. We think of history. We study it. We try to learn from it. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. But history, the effect of history in a, in a place like that is, is profound and I, I, I don't know that I would call it negative. Let's just say it's powerful. They, they think of themselves, his, these people, the, the citizens think of themselves as historically oriented, yes? Well, you're wonderful. Thank you for mentioning that because I hope it was one of the most important parts of the book for me to write and to learn about. History in the South is really emotional. It's all about family heritage, um, and it's not linear as it is in the North. For us, it's a set of facts. I mean, in the Midwest, I mean, but here, there's a grave site of great grandpa Felix, you know, <laughs> around the corner, and it is, and they are trapped by their history. Faulkner wrote this, of course, much better than I ever could, but they, they are trapped by their history, and yet, they have to keep living it over and over and over. And it's a wound that keeps being uh, recaptured and relived. And it makes me very sad. I wish they could get beyond it. But until you get beyond the issues of race and religion and economy, I don't know how you're it going. Is, is it, loosely speaking, the Civil War, the lost cause, the Confederacy, is that still alive, so to speak? I would ask, I'd fire right back at you, what do you think? It <laughs> certainly is in my little town. Uh -huh. It certainly is. Uh, all the monuments and homes and plaques and memorials and, I mean, you know, there was a famous shooting oh, in my yes. little town. So it's very, very vivid and I don't yet know, maybe you have an answer, maybe someone in the audience would, how, how the whites can, should they, can they apologize for the past? I don't know. It just keeps repeating itself. And now we have Georgia, and now we have voter whatever is going on with voting. I, it's very discouraging to me, very. It would be absolutely wrong to neglect talking about the kindnesses that you experienced in Marion. You had kidney stones. There is nothing like them. That's true. <laughs> Horrible. People, Horrible. People on a human-to-human, -human, day to day basis were very, very nice to you. Oh, extremely yeah. nice. Even though they sometimes looked at me as if I were some, something out of, crawled out under a rock. And they would refer to being a Yankee. Oh, they would still, well, you're a Yankee, they would say, so you can't quite understand this. But they were warm because it's just, now that's mostly because it's a small town. I don't know if it were a larger town, if their warmth would be there. Um, could I ever have broken into the small circle of first families of the town? Probably not, no. They were kind, but I was an employee to them. I was somewhere on the feudal, in the feudal system lot. Well, it, you can elaborate on that, expand on that a little bit. It's, it's, we're talking about historical eras and the, the era <laughs> of, of the rural South in some ways is hierarchical, almost, almost feudal, as you, I think you said. Well, again, 
I, I'm sure I could be correct. Everybody knows where you sit on the... You on do. The, yeah. you, you certainly do. Sometimes I found it unnerving because of just my position. People would treat me with this kind of <laughs> uh, respect that I don't know if I had earned it. But anyway, um, feudal. The society was feudal in the sense that it was really brought over to the West Indies from Africa, this sort of plantation society transplanted planted in South Carolina and then spread throughout the South. And the plantation, there are still plantations in the county that I live in. They own 30,000 acres of land. And the children of the, of the plantation owners are expected to take you know, superior positions in the town. But you're very, you kind of gossip about the people at the top as you would a, f a serf in a feudal lord or lady. I mean, you know, oh, they've, gone, they've gone to Maryland on a vacation. It's like Camelot. I wonder what the king is doing tonight. <laughs> Very nice. Much better than I've said. Good. Good. I mean, one lady apparently had what's, what was referred to often as a million dollar kitchen. She'd redone her kitchen. And people just talked about that endlessly. You go along, you're there a day, a week, a year, five years, seven, eight, nine. I don't think my sense from your book is not that there was a, a cataclysm or a catastrophe of any kind, but at some point you had to your, say to yourself, you know, this experiment has gone on long enough. Mm -hmm. what, can, do you have any sense of, of what tipped what tipped your decision making that way? Excellent question. And I've only thought about this even more recently than the publication of the book. I had to be self-effacing for so long there. I really couldn't be myself. I really could not express my opinions. I had to sit at dinners and listen to things being said that made me so angry and yet they were colleagues or church uh, family. And I grew exhausted from it. And I thought, I cannot do this the rest of my life. What a wonderful paradox. You go to a place to seek authenticity, and it deprives you of your own authenticity. You have to live day after day pretending to be other than you actually are. And isn't that sad? And that's what I realized finally, David, you must do, stop and do something. Uh, if you have to move again, you do. But All right. I have a question. It, I, I have to say, when I read this, I thought, when this young, when this man is, leaves, I was going to say escapes. That's a yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah, <laughs> when when that. he leaves yeah. Marion, Alabama, he's going to go someplace interesting. And you moved to Selma. I know. Selma is not Paris, you know. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but remember, I'd had enough of that. I'd done Paris and New York. I didn't want to do that anymore. I don't mind a small town. But, but Selma's six times larger than Marion, and it's just large enough mm -hmm. that I have a, a wider range of possibilities for friendships, and that's proven true. Um, I'm thinking of opening a little bookstore there, as a matter of fact, so. All right, well, that's actually, that is always the concluding question. For, usually for a writer, the, the last question is, are you, uh, and I'll ask you as well, because you are, you've been writing all your life. I mean, this may be, the book, but you've, you've put a million words in print. Are you going to write more? And if so, and also, what else are you going to do? What does the future hold? Well, it's, it's not another book like this. Not that I'm sorry I ever wrote this. I'm thrilled that I did. But it is fiction, and I've started. I have about, oh, quite a few thousand words into it. But because <coughs> I needed to have a narrative arc for my life because I have so much to say about my life and I refuse to write a memoir. I can't be another old white man writing a memoir. I just can't do that. So I think I've got the right uh, plot line and the way to infuse some of the things I've done into this character. And I'm very excited about it. So it will take place in the late 20th century, early 21st yes, century, it and it mm -hmm. will, will be fiction yep. and it will have a 
protagonist, not unlike yourself, and should I, we say. That's right. <laughs> I will call it the time of his life is what I tentatively have right. time. But. Well, when it's done, I will read it. This has been a pleasure. Thank, I've looked forward to this. And vice and versa. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Don. Thank you.